On today's show, why flying electric is great but also a bad idea, how an EU engine car ban will benefit Australia, a car that comes in no less than 10 different flavours, and a whole lot more. G'day and welcome, my name is Chris and I cover from an Australian perspective things like electric vehicles, renewables, wind, solar, battery storage and more. If you're new to the channel, welcome, thanks for coming along here, consider subscribing, it's free. And if you want to have early access to news, behind the scenes, polls and stuff that you just don't get here on YouTube, consider supporting me on Patreon where from as little as $2.50 per month you get all this and a lot more. And I want to say a big thank you to my producers Adam Tyson, Alan Burnt, Ashley Hill, Chaotic Media Technology, MN ICT Specialist Nigel Ferrier and Tessa Nagong. First up I'm going to talk to you about how an amazing, how amazing an electric aircraft can be but spoiler alert I'm then going to say aspects of it are actually a bad idea. Hang around to find out why. Hart Aerospace, a European aerospace company, recently announced that its ES-19 short-haul electric aircraft has been picked up by United Airlines and other major carriers in, around the world. By 2026, they would have delivered several hundred of these 19-seater aircraft. Able to provide a flight experience that is quieter not only to passengers but also nearby residents, these aircraft will significantly reduce direct operating costs and cover distances up to 400 kilometers or 216 nautical miles. That easily covers Sydney to Canberra or Melbourne to Falls Creek. Weirdly, here's where I start to have an issue with how aerospace, hard aerospace, is advertising this aircraft to airlines, as it's saying that they can reinvigorate lost revenue from routes that long ago became unprofitable. A few decades ago, 19-seat aircraft were very common. Since then, the large acquisition and maintenance costs of turboprop jet engines have made 19-seaters uneconomical. Regional planes averaged 20 seats in the 1980s, but today they're 80 seats. Why? Economies of scale. When the engine cost of ownership can be the same for a 19-seater or a 70-seater, and engine wear is the same whether you fly 100 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers, flying short hops with a small turboprop with a small turboprop aircraft is simply not profitable to airlines. Going electric means that motor costs are 20 times less expensive than a similar-sized turboprop, and about 100 times less expensive than the cheapest turbofan. More importantly, maintenance costs are more than 100 times lower. These lower operating costs will make a 19-seat electric aircraft competitive to that of, say, a 70-seater turboprop version. Great and awesome! In these challenging times, we all need cheaper forms of transport that cost less to purchase, run, and maintain. It makes economic sense. From an environmental perspective, it ticks a lot of boxes too. For instance, did you know that globally, short-haul flights under 2,000 kilometers account for 43% of carbon dioxide emissions from air travel? And in times when connecting people has never been more important, it would be great to see short-haul aircraft like this do the same journey without emissions. But will they? Right now in Australia, Qantas, our largest airline, hasn't committed to going 100% renewable power. Virgin Australia, the next largest one, hasn't either. Both of them don't require passengers to carbon offset their flight. Rather, you need to pay a small fee to make your flight clean and green. And that costs just a few cents to a few dollars. But do you know how many people pony up and pay for that offset? Just 1%. 1%. About $5 per seat from Sydney to Cairns. Green checked, credentialed, fully offset. Qantas Virgin, please just put this into your actual pricing and perhaps as a small tick, tick box to remove the charge and then follow it up with, hey, Qantas here. Did you know that an economy class return flight from London to New York emits an estimated 670 kilograms of CO2 per passenger? Are you sure you want to not offset no? Okay. Did you know that CO2 emissions from this flight is equivalent to 11% of the average annual emissions for someone like yourself? 
the optimist in me wants to believe that 80% of all people say, oh yikes, sure, please, yes, I'll set my flight. If it costs so little right now, the realist in me thinks that, well, 90% of passengers will say, save me five bucks today, let's go get some muffins. And here's my main issue. Suppose Qantas or Virgin went and purchased these electric planes. Do you think they'll fill them up with electrons from renewable sources? No. Will people pay to offset their carbon debt? No. Remembering that I'm all for cleaner, greener forms of transport, ones that decrease costs for consumers, improve communities, and more. Don't get me wrong, I want electric planes, but for short haul flights of 200 nautical miles or less? No. Many European countries have banned flights that can easily be done in two hours via train or bus. This offering by Heart Aerospace has its heart in the right space, and as, pa as battery density improves, this aircraft will be awesome for doing Melbourne to Brisbane, or insert your own 2000 km trip here. But as it currently stands, and until Qantas and other airlines actually use clean green energy to power these flights, I would much rather see our governments do a similar ban on short hop flights and instead get people using electric cars, electric buses, and other things that realistically take less time from door to door, compared to getting yourself to the airport, checking in, doing security, waiting for your plane, taxiing, flying, and the inevitable loss of baggage at the other end. So what do you think? Am I being too harsh on them? Is this something you want to see? Comment down below, I'd like to hear from you. NIO has announced that it's going to significantly expand its charging capabilities both in China and Europe, and maybe Australia? Its plan, NEO Power 2025, will mean that its current charging offerings, including this battery swap technology, will be expanded to 700 sites in China by the end of this year. To date, NEO has built 301 NEO Power Swap stations, 204 charger stations, and 382 destination charging stations. All of those are in China, mind you, and they've completed more than 2.9 million battery swaps. Pretty impressive. At present, 29% of NEO owners live within a three kilometer radius of a battery swap station, but by 2025, NEO plans to have more than 90% of its users to be within that three kilometer radius. NEO's plan to expand its charging and swapping network will have more than 4,000 battery swap stations worldwide, with 1,000 of those outside of China. And for those looking at this and thinking, yeah, cool Chris, I want this because time is money and I need to be on the road in three minutes. NEO has announced that the power charging and swapping system, as well as its battery as a service offering, will actually be available to other industry players if they so wish to approach them. Did you know that in 1903, a Russian diesel electric ship was launched that changed marine propulsion forever? Since then, combo systems whereby diesel is burnt to provide electrical power, which in turn is used by electric motors to propel ships through water. Fast forward 100 years and fully electric boats started appearing. Cute little things like this, but with engineers and passengers wanting zero emissions from their operation, it was only a matter of time before we started seeing bigger and bigger ships using a complete battery electric system. And in that lies a problem. In some ports, tugboats are needed to safely navigate larger vessels into and out of docking zones. Enter Crowley Marine Time Corporation with its E-Wolf tugboat. This first all-electric powered harbour tugboat can complete a job without expanding a drop of fuel. The 82-foot vessel with 70 tons of bollard pull, that's like 70 tons ability to keep a ship in place, which is roughly about 20% better than diesel equivalent versions. This thing is fitted with two 2100 kilowatt motors. Yeah, you heard right. 2100 kilowatt motors and a 6.2 megawatt hour battery. Huge numbers, right? Able to accommodate four Crowley they estimate that over the first 10 years of its use, an operation of this new E-Tug will reduce 178 tonnes of nitrogen oxide, 
2.5 tons of diesel particulate matter, and 3,100 metric tons of carbon dioxide versus a conventional tug. The electric tug will offset more than 30,000 gallons of diesel per year. That's basically $120,000 in diesel costs alone. Significant savings, and you can see why, why companies want to go electric. The thing I love about electric vehicles is that they're not constrained to accommodating massive engines, powertrains, and exhaust systems. Got a classic car? Great. Take out all those bits, insert an equal if not larger electric motor with a few batteries, and mmm, you've got a clean green machine. To demonstrate how flexible electric cars can be, look no further than VW's MEB platform or Hyundai Kia's Jump and GM Re. Look, there are many others out there, all with these skateboard designs, which sees motors, batteries, and chassis form the foundation of which nearly anything could be plonked on top of it. Well, nearly everything. And so it won't surprise any of us that car makers like startup electric brands will offer a pickup truck, utility vehicle, camper, and more. All underpinned by that universal platform that EVs provide. The X bus can be custom built to 10 modular interchangeable bodies. Want something around your inner city rumble? Get the convertible. We can worry order the pickup or van version. Maybe glamping is more your thing? Yeah, great. With integrated solar modules, single or dual motors, varying battery modules from 10 to 30 kilowatt hours, and an extremely light body weighing just 450 to 600 kilograms, electric brands claim that X-Bus can do up to 600 kilometers, 600 clicks. It sounds impossible, but supposedly that figure is helped along with its integrated solar panels, which can add up to 200 kilometers of range. The electric motors can provide up to 1,000 newton meters of torque. This multi-utility vehicle, MUV patent, Chris V, 2021, is now available for pre-order in these European countries. Whilst Australia doesn't have yet one on our horizon, the reveal video did hint that other markets could be added. And this is where you come in. Also, my fellow New Zealanders, get on it, bros. Jump online now and have a play with the online configurator. Then they'll see that a great deal of interest is coming from this side of the world. Price from $27,500, production is expected to start in mid-2022 and will initially be available to 600 dealers in Europe before expanding to 1,000 locations after that. If you're like me and have a large family, the options right now for an affordable electric vehicle that can carry seven are virtually non-existent. But that's about to change in a big way. Next port has announced that it will soon commence sales of the new BYD E6 People Mover, priced from, get this, $39,099 before on-road costs. That would make it cheaper than my MG ZS EV and way cheaper than the Kia Carnival, also a seven-seater. Featuring lithium phosphate blade battery technology, the 70 kilowatt hour People Mover reportedly can do 400 kilometers on one charge and it's moved along by a front drive 70 kilowatt electric motor. Whilst this is exciting, unfortunately, this first offering from Nextport will only be 15 examples of the 2022 BYD E6, and will be on our roads in August this year. I've got some good news for my fellow Australians. By default, I reckon we're going to see only electric cars being available for sale in Australia, with thanks to our European Union buddies. Announced last week by the EU, they have proposed an effective ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2035, acknowledging that ICE vehicle emissions contribute a significant portion towards climate change. The ban will occur in two phases. First, a 55% cut in CO2 emissions from cars by 2030 versus 2021 levels, then a 100% cut in CO2 emissions by 2035 meaning that car makers wouldn't be able to sell new fossil fuel powered vehicles in that 27 uh, country block. And here's my hope. Given that some of our cars 
come from European car makers or they produce them overseas, let's say in China, they won't bother making ICE car versions because, well, we're just too small. BMW Australia has released details of its upcoming electric scooter, the BMW CE04. This boxy future retro scooter looks like it will be a lot of fun to ride. The CE04 has a permanent magnetic electric motor mounted in the frame between the battery and rear wheel and can provide a maximum output of 31 kilowatts or 42 horsepower. For those familiar with cars and maybe not motorbikes, that's plenty punchy and will get you from 0 to 50 k's per hour in just 2.6 seconds. The new BMW CE04 can reach a maximum speed of 120 km per hour. An 8.9 kilowatt hour battery provides 130 km of range, which means it will be perfect for urban commuting needs. Or maybe an afternoon out on the back roads with the recharge at your local coffee shop in country Victoria. Equipped with a 6.9 kilowatt onboard charger, that means you could actually plug in with a 30 amp socket and get yourself fully recharged in about 45 minutes. Standard home charging is done via 10 amp and it's still in a respectable 4 hours and 20 minutes. In developing the BMW CE04, BMW Motorrad enables riders to choose between maximum efficiency and maximum riding, providing three different riding modes, eco, rain and road as standard. The additional dynamic riding mode is also available as an X-Works option, enabling the scooter to accelerate at an even swifter pace. Traction control is available on the new BMW CE04, as well as ASC dynamic traction control that should enable safe acceleration profiles, especially in banking positions. The new BMW C04 comes fitted as standard with a 10.25 inch TFT color screen with integrated map and navigation. And that first excites me. Built in navigation map on the instrument cluster with no additional display needed. Can I say thank you BM. My last bike was a BMW F800R and I loved it, but the only way I could get sat nav on it was realistically through a third party mounting accessory that held my phone. Sure, there was more expensive options out there like BMW's navigator system, but they were crazy expensive and if you left it on the bike and didn't remove it, were very attracted to thieves. With LED lights all around including adaptive headlights, the BMW CE04 has a lot going for it. Future oriented design and colourful scheme. Priced on $20,350 and available next year, I'm looking forward to giving this scooter a ride. All right, well, that brings us to the end of another episode. If you watched it to here, thank you very much. Really do appreciate it. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. Consider joining me over here on Patreon where you get early access to news, polls, behind the scenes, and stuff that I just can't show you here on YouTube. And if you do nothing else, please be good and be great. <laughs>